So welcome everybody to this uh, uh, third and last uh, webinar uh, organized by the Initiative for Science in Europe. Uh, this is a series of webinars that we uh, wanted to organize to uh, supplement or in parallel um, with uh, a a reports and, and white paper that we wrote about uh, early career researchers. And uh, this last webinar is dedicated to uh, grant evaluation processes or grant evaluation uh, procedures. And uh, so we have a, a number of uh, panelists joining us today, but before I go on um, and introduce them, I will uh, uh, give, the, give the floor to Martin Endler, the president of the Initiative for Science in Europe, uh, to say a few words uh, about uh, ISC. Martin? Thank you, Renaud. I'm very happy that we're organizing this and I'm very thankful to the people who have been working very hard on this issue for several months. The Initiative for Science in Europe is a nonprofit organization whose members are learned societies and science organizations in Europe. So we represent a whole lot of different areas of science and research. And uh, we speak for the various uh, science communities on uh, issues of science policy in Europe. We think, and I think that it is very important that we, that scientists make their views known by the different, by the European Union, by different governments, by science organizations, by science performing organizations about various issues about how we work, how science works. And this is what, you know, this is what this is about. We are, we have several topics that we're working on right now. Science precarity of science careers, of scientists' careers is one of them. It's a very important issue uh, affecting careers of young scientists and not so young scientists everywhere in Europe, actually everywhere in the world. And hopefully Europe might show a new way of uh, solving the contradictions involved in handling this, the contradiction between seeking excellence and uh, the fact that uh, scientists are human beings, they have lives and they have to be able to live their lives. So thank you, I welcome, uh, it's going to be very interesting as the last webinars have been. So thank you. Thank you, Martin. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we've had uh, this uh, report on the pre precarity of research careers. And we had uh, two uh, webinars preceding that one, one on the founding of academic careers and one on the researchment, research assessment practices. If you're interested in, uh, if you missed them and you're interested in seeing them, you can uh, still go to the webpage of ISC and there's a link, uh, they've been uploaded on YouTube and you can uh, see them on YouTube. Uh, now this uh, last webinar will be dedicated to uh, research grant evaluation practices. And joining us today to um, speak about this topic, we have uh, four experts. Um, and I'm just uh, going to introduce them briefly and then ask them to say a few words about themselves and about the topic. So our, our panelists today are Professor Catherine McMahon, who is a geologist and professor of geochemistry at the University of Bayreuth. Uh, and she has a lot of experience in the in the research grant evaluations because she was um, the chair of uh, one of the ERC panels dedicated to earth system sciences. Then we have Dr. Frederic Sgar, who is project administrator of the Global Science Forum at the OECD, the Organization for European Cooperation and Development. Um, uh, then Dr. James Morris, who is a senior policy officer at Science Europe, which is an organization that uh, whose members or which members are uh, founding bodies in uh, large funding bodies in Europe. And finally, we have Casper Gossink Mellenhorst, uh, who is coordinator of the Veni Vidivici Talent Program in Social Science and Humanities and senior policy officer at uh, NWO, the Dutch funding agency. So I will uh, give the floor first to Professor Catherine McMahon to uh, introduce herself and maybe say a few words about the topic. Okay, thank you very much, Renaud. So um, yes, he's introduced just about everything that I wanted to say about myself, that um, yeah, I'm based in Germany. So I'm most familiar with the German funding system. And then of course, I have served with the European Research Council um, most recently as a panel chair for the um, Earth System Science. So I'm guessing this role with the ERC is why I've been asked to participate in this panel. So 
I've read what's in the report and I must say it, I agree with just about everything that's being said in terms of the points that uh, have been made. And I just wanted to add a few things that um, uh, are part of this conversation. And that is that uh, there are some very rigid frameworks that we have in, um, in academia that are challenging to work within. And one of them, I think it's been mentioned in previous webinars is that um, there's very much this pyramid system where there are very, very few positions at the top levels. And, um, and so there's just a lot of competition for these positions, these long-term permanent positions. Um, and then another challenge is that, um, so we're talking about research funding today, their grant evaluations. Um, and quite often this takes place where the amount of financial resources is finite. And so you have to make decisions based on um, this constraint. And then um, I just like to finish by saying that uh, a lot of the conversation today is going to address the, the actual evaluation process um, in terms of uh, researchers' careers. But I want to also point out that one can also address it at the level of the researchers themselves. And so what I mean here is to look at a more level playing field, this, this concept of inclusiveness. And I'm certainly aware of this at the European level where there are countries that just, uh, they don't perform as well due to, for example, infrastructure that's just at a much lower level. And so I wanted to mention a few initiatives that the ERC in particular has uh, started to try to address these problems. Um, and that is uh, the ERC has started a visiting fellowship program. So this means that uh, potential applicants um, can spend time in an ERC funded lab just to get a sense of how things work, how, the, the, how do you write grant proposals and so on. That's actually been going for a few years and that seems to be uh, bearing fruit in terms of the number of, of applicants and success from these underrepresented countries. Another one is a mentoring initiative that was just announced. And so this is a concept where you actually have a, uh, a senior mentor who uh, provides support for the potential applicants so that one can hopefully in improve the success rate from these regions. And then the final one uh, is educational materials. And um, uh, so the ERC has some YouTube videos that are actually quite uh, informative in terms of just how does the system work and how can you uh, position yourself to be successful. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, next, I will ask uh, uh, Dr. Frederic Gard to uh, say a few words. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a topic which is obviously very dear to our hearts, actually. Um, the Global Science Forum of the OECD is a structure to, which is dedicated to international science policy. Uh, and the OECD is not just European, it's, it's global. We have many non-European members. Um, and it's a, it's a topic, the, the problem of, of research funding is a topic that we have been examined for, for the last few years, not just at the statistical level, because we do collect statistics on, on research funding from all countries, you know, both public and private funding, but also at the policy side. And how does it work? Is it efficient? Um, you know, what are the various systems? And we just completed the work two years ago on competitive research funding system, looking at assessing, you know, what is the efficiency of the system? When does it work best? In which context, etc. We just concluded some work on high risk, high reward research, and the report will be published in coming weeks. And again, the whole system of funding is very important there. And finally, to come back to the first topic that was mentioned, we also completed the work on the research precariat, the precarity of young researchers, particularly, and, and the, that report will be coming up also in a few weeks. So most of what I will say today is related to the work that was done in, in those recent reports. Now, when we talk about 
research funding, we have seen an increasing role of competitive funding. What, what, why do you have competitive funding? Well, initially, of course, there is a resource problem, but initially it's just because you consider that if you put people in a competition, you're going to increase the quality. You're going to force the, pop, the, the researchers that are going to apply to raise their standards and to make sure that the, the work, you know, the, the quality of their work will be higher, okay? Because the traditional system to evaluate the proposal is the peer review. Basically, it's an internal system where scientists trust their peer to review the quality of the proposal. And, and most funders, most research funders do uh, um, work with a peer review system. And, and we can, you know, again, discuss the details on that. So uh, the, the primary objective was to have this evaluation by peer to ensure that the work which is proposed is of scientific quality. Uh, people say scientific excellence. Uh, um, excellence doesn't mean anything, but okay, it's high quality, right? Okay. The problem arises now is that not only do you have this primary goal, which is you know, high quality, but a number of additional objectives have been added to the initial objective. So not only are you requested to deliver a quality science, but increasingly, you are requested to deliver a societal impact, uh, some capacity building, um, respond to national priorities, uh, etc. And, and and then the question is: Is the current system of evaluation able to assess all these criteria, as well as the initial objective, which is it's a good you know, it's a good scientific proposal. And, and just by peers, you know, just by other scientists whose job is just to, you know, do research and, and, and produce science, are they able to say, oh yeah, that's going to have a great impact on society. So you can see already that this shift towards new objective is challenging the system um, in, in itself. And, and then, because the system is, is in a way by consensus and you have a peer review system that people you know, exchange information, et cetera, and then meet in panel, et cetera. And then that consensus in itself has some drawbacks. Yes, it will you know, ensure that the, the, the proposals which are selected are of quality, but it will remove asperities because you don't have a consensus on things which are out of the ordinary. And, and that's something which really is, was striking where we work on high risk, high reward uh, research, which is basically risk taking is not rewarded just because of the system is not tailored for that. You know, if you, if you say, you know, oh, this is going to be a risky proposal, it may not succeed, it's going to be rejected because that's what, what you're expected. On top of that, of course, there is the carrier pressure is that the people who are going to make a proposal, they more or less want to make sure that they will be able to publish because that's what's expected to them. So in a three-year proposal to, to be sure that you're going to be able to publish, then it's going to tailor your proposal. You know, say, I already know that, you know, I've done part of the experiment already. So I know that that's going to work Maybe there are a few new things in it, but more or less, you know, yeah, that, that's, that's going to work. It's a good quality, et cetera. And then when you look at how the evaluators assess, you know, the various criteria, what are they looking for? Well, the first element that they are looking for is, you know, the, 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 the background, the track record. Uh, is the, scient the scientist making the proposal, you know, already good, okay, by publications or whatever, is the laboratory that he's working in already good, okay? It's an insurance policy, right? Okay, that again, you know, puts some boundaries into the type of proposal you can, you can accept. Then there is a scientific expectation, you know, the quality. So that means, of course, uh, you expect that it's going to deliver publication. And then there are all these new criteria that they are, the, the juries, the evaluators are expected to 
assess without, you know, honestly having any uh, objective criteria. It's just more a feeling, but they are usually not trained for that. You know, assessing the potential societal impact of a proposal is extremely hard for, for anybody. So even more for a normal scientist. So you can see all the challenges that increasingly put some weight onto the system, which initially was pretty well developed. And then finally, because it's a long book, and I'm sorry for that, is a problem of success rate. And success rate, you know, we can't escape that. Um, if you have a 30 or 40% success rate, more or less, you will be able to find all the good proposal. Because what people told us is, more or less, we have one third of good proposal, one third of those which you know, would be nice to fund, but, you know, there may be some caveats and what sort of bad proposal. But if you have 10% of success rates, it's a lottery. You just can't choose within the good proposal. So you can see all the challenges which are adding up. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Frederick. Um, uh, next, I will ask uh, James to say a couple of words and present himself. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I'd firstly like to thank uh, ISC for organizing this very interesting and I think timely uh, webinar series. Um, I'm James. I'm a senior policy officer at Science Europe. Um, I joined Science Europe just over a year and a half ago, uh, and my background is in marine and molecular biology. Um, Science Europe is an association of uh, the major funding and performing organizations in Europe. Uh, and since joining, I've been looking after our work on research assessment processes and practices. I think as an introduction, I'd just like to highlight that over the last couple of years, um, Science Europe has been conducting a, an extensive study of the assessment processes of its members uh, and other selected organizations, and then has followed that up with the publication last year of a, a position statement and a set of recommendations on the topic. Um, and that publication represents a, a kind of position, a consensus position amongst our members. The study looked at uh, the assessment for funding allocation by funding organizations and also career progression in, in research performing organizations. Um, the recommendations focus on many aspects of assessment processes, um, several of which I think are particularly relevant to this uh, today's discussion and also the ISE position that was produced. I think those include um, transparency in the terms used as targets for funding. Um, for instance, the, the, the concept of excellence, as, as Frederick already said, um, the efficiency of assessment processes for applicants, um, how to incorporate uh, qualitative assessments into assessment processes, uh, and also the development of and implementation of, uh, of novel approaches to assessment procedures. Um, so just to, as a, as a final introductory note, um, I'll say that uh, assessment and evaluation processes are a core activity of, of funding and performing organizations and that these processes influence all aspects of how research is conducted, how it's performed and how it's disseminated, um, which in turn influences the careers of, of, of the researchers that are on the receiving end. So it's, it's really important that, that these processes are fair, efficient, effective and transparent. And then that's all for me. Thank you, James. Casper? Uh, also, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, uh, as I said, I work at NWO, the Dutch Research Council. Uh, I work on our uh, talent program, one of these uh, excellence uh, uh, grants. Um, but I also work on what we call responsible research assessment. Um, and in effect, it means that uh, part of my job is trying to force uh, culture change in academia, in the way we uh, assess. Um, so uh, it's also because as a funder, um, we're kind of in a unique position. Um, as an individual university, for instance, it's, it's a lot harder to change the way people are assessed and what's important. We as a national funder um, serve all uh, academics. Um, uh, so if we can change things, it, it usually has a large impact. 
Um, so what I do is we we try to uh, change our uh, the, the way we evaluate first of all by uh, looking at uh, if in our funding schemes if the uh, quality of a researcher is important at all, and if not, then we do not ask for a CV, for instance, to make sure that it is about the idea. Um, but if in a funding instrument it is important, then um, we've introduced uh, a narrative CV. I know it's also uh, a hotly debated topic if that's effective. We believe it is, uh, at least the way we've uh, developed it. Um, which, with doing that, we try to increase the validity of uh, measuring quality, um, but also to improve chances for varying career paths. Uh, to make sure that we remove incentives for publish or perish, uh, look at quality uh, rather than at quantity, um, and at the same time try to reduce uh, application uh, pressure, especially for our early career grants, um, which we might come back to um, uh, because I, I know that it's also something that people worry about that you spend a lot more time on narrative CVs, for instance. Um, and uh, to come back to something that uh, Frederic uh, just uh, said, where we also uh, have started doing is to train our, uh, our panel members to make sure that they know what, what we look for, uh, they know how to um, evaluate and also to um, well, to increase more or less the intercoder uh, reliability of, uh, of the assessment. Um, I think I should uh, keep it at that for now, and then uh, we can uh, get to the main part. Thank you, Gaspar. So I'm actually going to bounce on that and, and ask you to maybe tell us a bit more about the narrative CV, because I think there's a number of points that were um, uh, raised by, uh, for instance, by uh, Fadek and, and by yourself, uh, or also by, I think, uh, something that is mentioned in the reports that James mentioned, this is, which is, what is excellence? Uh, there is often not a very clear definition of what is excellence, and um, which I think uh, mostly in the past people have measured only as uh, how many high impact papers you have published, for instance, how, uh, how often you were cited. And so I guess this is. Um, one of the driving forces behind uh, introducing a, a, a type of narrative CV. And so, as you said, I mean, my experience of the narrative CV is that it takes a lot more time to write uh, than, than an actual CV, especially when you are being repeatedly asked to uh, recombine the same information in a different format. And I, I have, a, so I, I would be interested to know more about it and, and really what was the what was the thinking at NWO behind that. Also, I, I have a, a side question, which is, uh, does that not include a, a bias towards people who are good at writing uh, nice stories uh, or a different type of bias uh, in some way? Well, to answer the last part, uh, it depends on how you uh, shape not only the, the narrative CV itself, uh, but also uh, how you instruct your, uh, your, your committee members. Um, we strongly focus on substantiation in, uh, in both the CV and the assessment. So um, yes, we ask for a narrative, we ask for explanation. Um, and um, uh, we, uh, uh, we expect uh, narrative descriptions, but we do not exclude all indicators. Uh, we ask people to uh, substantiate what they are claiming with proof, with examples. Um, and we only exclude some things that we know that are unreliable. Um, and um, what we see is that we've also had this evaluated um, uh, by external uh, researchers. We see that that uh, boasting um, doesn't work. Uh, only if you have something to show can you actually uh, um, get a decent grade. And what might also be relevant to know is it doesn't change that much about who we select, but it just increases chances for some people that wouldn't be able to show their qualities otherwise. So for instance, in our early career grants last year, um, we've awarded uh, 
someone who was an external PhD that didn't have any research appointments at all. Um, uh, also not after a PhD. Uh, and this is our most competitive uh, funding grant, mainly aimed at uh, uh, the, the best talents that have somehow a great CV. But this person could show experience outside of academia that was very relevant and explain why it was relevant. Um, that, that's what it does for us. Um, and yes, it does take some time. Um, we've uh, also looked into this. It's about 20 hours in total per person to write a narrative CV. Um, we use the same uh, module throughout our uh, organization that helps. We try to get it accepted outside of uh, Netherlands. For instance, uh, the, I know it's not a big deal probably, but Luxembourg has done uh, has introduced the same format to reduce the time people spend on it. But yes, it, it does take a li little bit more time. So what we've done in the, um, uh, um, the funding round where, uh, uh, where we've introduced this, said okay if you if you get this grant you have to have a great cv you have to have a great idea um so we know that people that do not score uh, well on cv don't get uh, a grant anyway so we've done a first selection only on cv because it's the idea that takes the most time by far um and that way we've reduced the time people spend in total uh, for on the macro level and on the individual level, we we haven't increased it uh, for anyone. Uh, so that's more or less uh, our words for us. Okay, so I, I understand that. It, 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 uh, yes, Catherine, you wanna you wanna say something? Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, since it relates to this uh, question um, regarding the narrative CV, so I actually see this as a positive development towards the future. Um, it's certainly within the ERC, there's the need to evaluate a vast range of different research fields. And something the narrative CV has over the traditional type is that it allows the applicant to specify what the impact of the publications are or what is the impact of the particular activities that they've uh, engaged in. And so over the years, there's been more emphasis on um, this aspect of the CV. And then, um, yeah, I, I think that that's important with regard to may, having a fair evaluation with an evaluator that has really not a very good idea of what these papers that are being published mean. Maybe it forces people also to put uh... Uh, maybe certain things they would not have put in a more regular CV. It forces them to 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 write that into a, into a coherent narrative. Yes, Casper. It, it also uh, allows you to uh, not talk about certain topics. I think that's also a very important part here. Is that if you have lists and you have sections, then all sections need to be filled out. Otherwise, to anyone evaluating, um, it just looks like oh, you haven't done this. But it might, it might be something that's not important uh, in your particular case. Um, so um, in essence, what we're doing is uh, saying, OK, it might be attractive to put everybody uh, uh, along sort of the same measuring scale uh, and expect exactly the same. But it means that you expect every researcher to be able to do everything while it might not be relevant to the, the particular proposal or the particular field, field at all. Um, and the same goes for, for, for instance, length of publication lists or, or number of top journal publications. It doesn't mean that much in essence about if somebody is capable of doing the particular research and is, is very good at that, if they have other qualities that are very relevant, but if you say, okay, everybody must have this list and then we can compare them, it's an easy comparison, but it doesn't really measure quality uh, that well. Um, and I've, I've seen that uh, some people have also asked, well, why is this about grant evaluation? But this, uh, in, obviously I work at a funding uh, agency, um, but we do not only evaluate researchers at funding agencies. 
We also use, for instance, CVs to, to, uh, to hire people at universities. And it works the same way, only the criteria aren't specified. Um, so these, these uh, ways of looking at people can be implemented beyond just the funders. I think that's, that's very relevant. Yes, I think it's a, it's a very convincing argument, actually, the, the, the fact that you can avoid speaking about certain topics. Um, and now I would like to ask uh, James and Felix. So, so, I'm, so NWO is uh, using the narrative CV. I'm aware that I believe the Swiss National Science Foundation, the Australian Research Council I had experience with, and, and the ERC to an extent. Uh, so is that, uh, James and, and Frederick, is that something that we are going to see becoming really widespread throughout Europe, do you think? Um, well, maybe I can just um, go. Uh, certainly, from the um, study that we conducted, uh, as you said, we had many examples from our, our members who are already uh, implementing uh, narrative style CVs. Um, the Swiss NWO FNR in, in Luxembourg, as examples, we had others as well. I think to your point, when we raised this in consultation with our members, when we were developing recommendations, those that had not implemented anything like that were really interested in the concept. Um, and so I think it is um, certainly the signals we've had in discussions with our members. It's something that is, um, there's a lot of interest in funding and performing organizations to uh, implement that as part of this, this more broader approach towards incorporating qualitative elements in assessment processes. Um, and I think just to also highlight what what Casper said. There was a um, a strong discussion on this idea that researchers, when they're developing these narrative TVs, have the freedom to include what they want to emphasise as part of their their own kind of progress as as a researcher. So whether that's public engagement or whether it's it's mentoring, um, it's not all about. Um, trying to hit every tick box. It's, you know, I, I care more about the, the public engagement side of my research, for instance. So I want to highlight in that in the narrative CV. And I think there were several funding organizations that were really interested in that element of it as well. Frederick, do you have a. So, so to, to, to be honest, this is not a topic that really emerged when we did our, our study. Um, there was a lot of experiments regarding interviews, which is, is in a way a, a, a bit similar in that um, it does allow the team that have a proposal to develop much further than on a rigid set of criteria in a traditional proposal. Um, and what was found is that potentially it did help um, go beyond what would be the, the initial expectation or initial judgment of the panel. Because um, sometimes they just don't necessarily understand what is the real objective or what is the real potential of a proposal. And having exchanges through an interview allow that. It was also found that potentially it would also um, increase the bias against women, which is something you have to consider because um, Traditionally, um, men would be more at ease to boost potential impact than women, and, and it's it's both a question of training and and of um, you know of, of context, etc. But for instance, when we had uh, a presentation on a funding scheme from Switzerland on high risk, high reward research, they found out that you know they, they were trying to be more open uh, on the system and and provide more opportunity, opportunities to the team to explain. What were the objective uh, besides the traditional, you know, background on bibliographic, etc. And, and they found that it actually selected against women that we are more careful to present the, the potential of their work. So you can go against that, but it has to be taken into account. Casper, you would like to respond? Things. Yes, it's it's very important to take into account. Um, it's actually been the basis of the way we've designed it. Um, the idea that we we wanted to remove. Uh, biases um, and try to avoid introducing, uh, introducing new ones. Um, and what you, I think the, the most dangerous thing to do is to add it, to, to have a, a narrative part, but keep the old CV as well. Um, 
then you have both biases increasing, uh, increasing uh, each other. Um, it also matters if you uh, uh, allow people to mention H indexes or journal impact factors, for instance. But we've, we've had the effect of our CV uh, tested um, and it actually increased chances for female researchers. Um, so I, I know uh, research by Dr. Uh, Klaatje Finkenberg, who uh, uh, looked at the narrative part of the ERC uh, format, showed that uh, there women uh, uh, did worse than men uh, with uh, comparable uh, uh, CVs. Um, but uh, as far as I can tell, the main reason for that is lack of um, uh, well proper instruction and and um, or guidance for those uh, looking at the CVs and making an, an assessment. So also the criteria are vital uh, for how you uh, assess everything and then they must be very clear and specific. So before we uh, maybe move on to a, to a different topic, uh, I wanted to ask you all if there is, if it has ever been considered to just uh, do away entirely with the CV. Because in my experience, uh, evaluating grants in a panel at uh, INR, um, I've actually, maybe I shouldn't say that, but I've actually rarely looked at the CV of the applicants. And I don't think that uh, it, it made a, my evaluations were hugely different than uh, those of my colleagues who maybe looked at the CV of the applicants. And I didn't think it was necessarily uh, extremely useful to judge of the, to judge of the quality um, of the of the science that is in in the proposal. These are actually uh, first round four pages proposal. Just to give you some background, and and in the community where I'm from, uh, which is a computational neuroscience, uh, there's actually a big conference in Europe where they moved to double blind reviews uh, many years ago, and and they could they could actually demonstrate that this. Um, remove the number of uh, biases that people had, for instance, against certain institutions or certain countries where maybe evaluators judged that the, the, the papers that were submitted to that conference from these places were not serious enough. Um, just, and, and so is there anything like this that is considered at all uh, among funding, uh, funding bodies? Maybe Catherine, I don't know if the ERC uh, had discussions about an ID like this. So I think um, this is an intriguing uh, topic. Uh, certainly with the ERC, I think um, that uh, throughout the program, there's been so much effort, emphasis on the project is, is half of the um, consideration and the PI is the other half of the consideration. So I'm trying to think it could be in certain fields, this concept could be more tractable. But one of the questions about a funding organization that they have is, well, if we give these large sums of money to a researcher, um, we want to have some confidence that the funds will be spent productively. So whether it's in training or whether it's in developing new ideas or whatever it happens to be. And I, I'm trying to think how this can work if you don't see the track record of the person carrying out the work. So I need to think about this a bit more, but um, I certainly have not been in this experience. Frederick, you wanted to say something? Yeah, so that's not actually something we have looked very carefully because there are many, many funders that have tried that, either uh, public funders or even private funders. Um, and that has proved to be very successful when you want to initiate new ideas, new proposal, because it does remove part of the bias and it does encourage people to take more risk in their proposal. Um, you have to uh, um, realize that for a number of, of um, researchers, particularly those that may not come from a very famous laboratory, uh, there is a strong bias in the selection process. So having removing the, the track record or the origin of uh, the lab from the proposal, at least in the initial stage, because as, as Catherine says, you, you, you also want to ensure that there is a, a proper um, organization and, and process behind the proposal, but at least to make sure that you can accept original ideas without preconception, that has, you know, has proved to be very successful. 
Um, but you know there is a very strong pressure to keep it, uh, and it's not very surprising because peer review system is is you know within the academic system is people know each other, and 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 there is a, a tradition of you know. Um, looking at the quality based from the track record BEMS from the laboratory. And you actually have some funding systems which are uniquely based on the track record, you know, saying we're just going to fund good people and they will produce good research, you know, and, and that's good enough. And that's a bit the, 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 the system of the ORDU's ground in the US and it does work. So there is nothing that prevents, you know, um, keeping or removing the the track record uh, or the origin, the, the question is really what do you want to achieve? And how do you match the evaluation process to your objectives? And that's currently what is, is probably missing. There is an increasing mismatch between the objective and the evaluation process. And that can be addressed, but currently you just can't ask the traditional evaluation process to respond adequately to all the constraints, to all the criteria. Casper? Okay, uh, yes, well, this is uh, exactly what we've been doing. I think you can always discuss, obviously, if the, the goals that we have are the right ones, but uh, the uh, responsible research assessment group that I'm in, what, what we uh, have had as a, a job within our organization is to look at all our funding instruments and to see whether a CV was necessary. Um, and if it's not, it was scrapped. Uh, so um, there are the, the uh, rounds I'm responsible for, so the talent scheme, uh, we do ask for a CV, but, but what's also something that we do now is everything that's um, what we call administrative information. So where do you work currently? Um, where did you get your PhD? Uh, so anything like that. Uh, also uh, your last name, we don't ask for first names or uh, for gender, uh, is always at the bottom of any form. It's never the first information that you see because uh, it's not only in, in uh, so the time frame of uh, assessment procedures that it matters what you see uh, at which moment, but even in, in a single assessment moment, it matters what you see first. So if the idea is the first thing that you see, it becomes the most important thing that you evaluate. It, it, that's it's sort of an anchoring effect of uh, in the assessment procedure. Um, so for any assessment of of, uh, uh, of of anyone's research idea, uh, if you do if you have funding rounds within a university, it's um, it's important. I, I feel to to first look at the idea to make sure that the track record of the person doesn't sort of pollute your uh, your assessment of what the proposal is. Thanks, James. Do you want to say a few words? Yeah, maybe just just to compliment. I think it, it in some way comes down to the um, the position at which that information is is available. I, I certainly see the merit of having elements of CV as a as a checking mechanism. Um, but as Casper said, if it's if uh, the researcher's track record is is not really relevant to the aims of that program. Then, uh, then it, it, it shouldn't be involved in, in strongly in that decision-making process. Um, we have um, several examples from our members where they're starting to implement double-blind um, assessment procedures and, and the feedback we've received from them is, is positive. Um, so I think it's, uh, it, it's certainly an interesting conversation. As, as Frederick said, um, it's uh, not a, a, I suppose it's not a, a fast moving change. CVs are, are a quite a staple of, of, of assessment processes, of hiring processes in and outside uh, of research. So I think it will be, uh, it will take uh, quite some time before that really kind of filters into to a lot of mainstream programs, but it's a very interesting discussion to, to be having. Okay, so I think uh, we are going to, thanks uh, James, uh, I think we are going to, uh, to move on to a, a, a different uh, topic, which was, uh, there was also a question in the, in the chat about it, uh, which is this idea of 
um, multi-stage uh, evaluation uh, with the notion that this is meant to reduce the workload for applicants and for evaluation committees. Um, and also the, the notion that um, maybe at a second stage, a lottery is a more uh, effective system to distribute the money than having uh, to write a, a full uh, uh, full length proposal. And I think there was a paper in PLOS computational biology maybe two years ago where uh, the authors um, using economics arguments uh, put forward the idea that if the funding rates drops below a certain level, uh, it might be more economical to just randomly distribute the money after an initial evaluation than to uh, go on with a second uh, lengthy pr evaluation procedure. And, um, and as I mentioned, I, I'm in a panel at uh, INR, and I, I was uh, curious about the, the workload that, it, because we have a two-stage evaluation procedure, I was curious about the workload that is actually cut by this. And uh, I, I did a, a bit of a, a silly calculation, but it's about 40% pages uh, less to produce or to read uh, for the panel. So it was a, a less of a reduction than, than I'd uh, anticipated. And um, so I think there's a, a lottery, uh, um, uh, a pilot that is being done at NWO, uh, if I'm correct. And I thought maybe, Casper, you would want to uh, say a few words about that. Well, we uh, lottery is something that we're discussing. There is there is a lottery in one of our funding schemes, but it's uh, and it's quite an extreme one actually. But uh, I think the uh, more um, sort of standard lottery procedures are uh, introduced at uh, Volkswagen Stiftum, uh, uh, the uh, New Zealand Research Council, um, oh, there's a few others. We, we have one uh, that's uh, especially aimed at uh, uh, education researchers, um, where uh, it's well. Our, our Ministry uh, of Education and Culture um, has specific money uh, for a particular type of researcher. Um, and um, their only demand is that the research is good enough. So what we do is uh, we ask uh, people to only um, send us um, a, a, an indication that they, are, they want to write a proposal. Then there is a lottery. And we only check if they are, uh, are from the target group. Uh, with lottery, we select those that will get a grant. Then they have to write a proposal. And all we do is check if the, if the proposal is good enough. That's it. But th this is for a very small grant. And it's a kind of an obscure round. In our normal procedures, the only thing we do is if there is, uh, in the end, an ex aqua position around uh, the uh, fund or uh, no fund uh, um, line, then, and there is no other way to resolve it, then we can use a lottery, but only in that sense. And that doesn't save anyone time at all, uh, that last uh, Part. The, 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 the most effective thing we've done to save time is uh, um, to introduce the first selection on CV um, because we've uh, also researched this. About 90% of time spent on uh, our competitive uh, uh, grants is spent by the applicants. Um, and by introducing a first selection on CV, even with a narrative CV, uh, we save on micro level about 70% of the time spent by applicants. Uh, so that has a fast uh, impact. But lottery depends, I believe, on uh, with what objective you want to do a lottery and then what type of lottery at what stage of the round you, uh, you introduce. Most people, um, when they talk about lottery, they think at the end of the round, there's a group that's obviously uh, good enough to fund, uh, then a group that's obviously not good enough to fund, and in the middle you'll have a lottery. Well, that means, first of all, that you have the entire funding round, usually, before you get to that stage. And in our experience, the rank order is uh, always marginal steps from top to bottom. So drawing two lines is more difficult than drawing one line. Um, so that's something that we do not do. Uh, I must maybe also add uh, that we're not allowed to do because of the Dutch law. 
Um, so even if we wanted to, um, uh, first our parliament has to change the law. Yes, Frederick. So that's an interesting system, isn't it? Um, I think you 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 did uh, um, clarify, I think, pretty well what are the uh, the issues there. Um, clearly, if you if you if it can mask as a tiebreaker, um, basically. You know, if you if you don't have good criteria enough, good argument enough for a, a number of the proposal, then it's a logical way and it's a fair way. Uh, uh, although that's not something that the community likes, because the community likes to be in control. And I mean, the community, the research community, because they like actually the peer review system. It's it's their peer, it's themselves, isn't it? Uh, that's the first. You know, that's the first argument. The second one is, is that more efficient, or put it in the reverse way, is there an added value into the peer review process? And that added value is not just by selecting the good proposal, it is also by feeding back comments to the proposers, to the scientists to improve the proposal. And, and some funders do that very well. Uh, and, you know, within or on outside Europe, where the internal uh, staff of the funding agencies do play a, cri a critical role in, in dialoguing with the research scientists that make the proposal and, and help actually improve the proposal um, through question exchange, etc. So there is an added value into the evaluation process itself. Uh, if there is no added value, then of course the lottery is much simpler, but usually you have, as Casper said, to go through the first step of evaluation anyway because going from the start, you know, to a, a lottery would mean that there is no value whatsoever in a, a peer review process. And there are publications that suggest, you know, they, you know, I'm not an expert, but there are publications that suggest that evaluation in funding agencies do have some value in selecting good proposals, in selecting proposals that will deliver an above average if there was no selection in terms of scientific impact. No, that there is controversy in the publication because you know, depending on the time you look after the, the proposal is funded to look at publications and, and what you know sort of impact factor do you use, etc. But nevertheless, there are suggestions that the reviewing process do have some value in selecting good proposal. Um, so you know, having just a full lottery system would probably not be as efficient. Nevertheless, it could come handy as again as a tiebreaker. Hmm. Thanks. Uh, so, so maybe Catherine, then I will I'll bounce on that. Um, so, do, do you see from your experience in the ERC panel that you the, the the review the panel really adds values or in selecting the, the very best proposals, but also maybe in um, uh, improving chances for uh, applicants who might submit uh, you know a, a year or two years later. Right. Um, Yes, these are all excellent points that are being made. I think um, I can certainly speak to the feedback that's given to applicants. I mean, we hear a lot of positive uh, comments about this because we generally have um, up to 10, 12 reviewers for these proposals. And they there's always very uh, detailed comments that are given back to the uh, participants and the panel actually goes through these comments to make sure that there is that they're appropriate and, and collegial and so on. Um, I, I coming back to the the two stage process that that you also talked about in the um, asking this question. Um, so the ERC, in I think most of its instruments actually has this two-step process, but it's unusual in that both steps occur at the same time. So the applicant actually has to write both parts of the proposal, the synopsis, and then also the details of what they're going to do. And um, the arguments advanced in, in terms of this type of approach um, are basically that of time that if you have a two-stage process where there is 
um, the, the initial round decisions are made and then you go back to the applicants and say, congratulations, you made it through. Now you have to write the full proposal. Um, this adds quite a number of months to the process in order to be fair to the applicant. Um, whereas I think, uh, the, the approach that the ERC takes, it, it all happens within uh, a, a, the space of, let's say eight or nine months. Um, it, speaking to the amount of work that is involved in the, uh, for the panel members, um, I, I really am trying to understand how a lottery system could reduce that work if you have to read all of the proposals anyway, to evaluate whether, you know, which part of the group that they fall into. Um, but uh, it, it, as Casper said, there are certain situations in which it could make sense for a, uh, another factor other than uh, the, the, there's biases that crop up that unfairly advantage or disadvantage applicants. So that could be a more level playing field. I think that the proposal that was made in the paper I was mentioning was actually to have a, a two-stage evaluation process where um, the applicants only submit a very short proposal and then uh, you just make two piles and in the fundable pile, uh, you just randomly select the projects. So there was no a second stage, so it, it would, in that sense, it I think it would shorten the evaluation procedure and the workload because you don't have to write a full proposal and also because you don't have to evaluate the full proposal. And so I, I'm just going to uh, go to James and um, uh, to ask him if, uh, from, from Science Europe, if, if this is, if uh, this kind of lottery IDs are, are, are they being tested in other funding agencies? Is that something that people are thinking about? We, we have a, a, a couple of other examples I, I'd like to highlight, and I think it links to, to, to the previous question as well, is the, the Austrian Science Fund have a program called the 1000 Ideas Program, um, which starts with a, a form of double blind assessment, uh, and then as a second stage has a, uh, a part evaluation panel selection, part random allocation. Um, so that's a kind of a, a half lottery um, system and, and the feedback they, they've received on it so far is that it's well received. Um, I think more generally, there needs to be really clear communication on, on, on all of these types of novel approaches. They need to be kind of hypothesis based um, and, and kind of evidence based if, if the evidence is, is available. Uh, and, and if that's communicated to applicants and to reviewers, and I think that really helps um, kind of push those those processes forward. Um, I think it also comes down to, as Frederick said, the the, the purpose of the lotteries, and that, and that comes back to the, the the hypothesis whether it is for a tiebreaker, whether it is to try and select maybe higher risk projects from the pool that have already made the threshold. Um, I think the, those are all key elements, and, and and what we recommend at Science Europe is that. Is that when you're thinking about novel approaches, you 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 really ask the questions why not not just because they're available to you. What why would you want to implement the lottery? And then once you've started implementing it, um, evaluate it and 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 try and share those evaluations with other research organisations for for kind of mutual learning purposes as well. Mm. So uh, speaking speaking about uh, panels, actually, the, I see there's a question uh, uh, by Matthew in the, in the forum. Um, um, so I, I'm just going to read this question. So is there an argument for including more junior researchers as evaluators uh, sitting in funding committees? And this could help grant evaluation evolve through a new generation of researchers and embed it more concretely. I'm just going to add uh, uh, two things to that. Uh, so uh, from the, the Science Europe uh, uh, report from, uh, from last year, this was actually uh, one point that was made in, I believe, in the report. And uh, also, I think it, it could uh, uh, serve as a, uh, some kind of uh, additional mentoring initiative. So Catherine was mentioning this idea that you, you, you're being mentored in writing uh, good proposals. And I think at least for me, it has been a very formative experience to see 
to, to actually read a whole lot of proposals and to be part of the process to understand uh, you know what what is uh, what is important what is not important what what you need to pay attention to uh, what constitutes an interesting and good proposal maybe in the eyes of a panel and so definitely sitting in in a grant evaluation panel is is a very useful thing so do do we absolutely need to have only very senior people it's also very hard to get them usually because these are very busy people and so i don't know um who wants to go first on this um Frederic, go ahead. Okay, I'll start and then Catherine. Um, so, so this is something which has been tried. Uh, there was a, a series of experiments, I believe, in the UK, where not only did they use a first step of, of, of blind application, but they tested to see whether they would include participants or previous participants, participants to the, to the year before, of, uh, of the funding scheme into the jury and, and comparing that to, to the normal traditional jury. And it did affect the results. And, and basically what it does, it, it, the, the younger the jury you have, the more risk taking the jury becomes. It, it's less risk adverse. Uh, the more senior jury are just risk adverse. You know, they, they, they will play safe while younger jury will tend to be more interested into the novelty of the proposal um, and, and less into the actual potential feasibility, uh, you know, whether it's by track record or whatever. So it does affect actually the results and that's quite an interesting experiment. Hmm. That's really, it's really interesting. Uh, Catherine, can we, can we imagine the ERC uh, having maybe more junior people uh, involved in the panels? Okay, I, I mean, that's a very specific question with regard to the ERC that I'm probably not going to touch here. But I want to say, I mean, the younger generations, they're the future. And it's absolutely critical that they are involved in all of these different processes. Um, I see there being comments about transparency. And I also strongly support that because you need to provide this knowledge of how the system works. Um, in terms of the review process, I mean, I think every responsible senior person should be involving uh, their students even in the review process for manuscripts, for example. I mean, there's a lot of talk of how it's so difficult to find reviewers for manuscripts these days. Well, I mean, the, the younger generations are part of the process. And so this just escalates upwards to being having positions of responsibility in uh, funding decisions. And I, I might say that uh, my experience with an organization on the other side of the world, on the American Geophysical Union, um, in their new governance model 10 years ago, they, they said, the younger generation students, early career scientists, they must have a place at the decision table. And they've, they have members, uh, student members of the board of directors because, um, and, and uh, I've always been amazed at the insights that come from them. And I'm not surprised to hear that uh, the, the amount of risk aversity has changed if you change the, the composition. And so, um, every opportunity I have to involve the younger generation in the process, um, I take it. And I think that's certainly a very strong um, outcome that one should support. Yes, Kasper. I'd like to add, first of all, just from experience, um, in general, the more diverse our, our committees are, the better they function. So uh, in seniority, but and lots of different aspects. Um, I think we also uh, uh, well feel very strongly about that the idea that as an applicant, uh, it's best if you can recognize yourself in somebody on the panel in any uh, form that that uh, makes you feel more comfortable. For instance, if there is an interview. Um, at NWO, we're also part of uh, uh, something called. Uh, recognition and rewards, um, uh, an initiative 
from all Dutch universities and research institutes and funders uh, about changing the way uh, we look at evaluating researchers uh, also at universities. So um, looking at, um, well, diversifying what uh, an academic can look like, what's important, but for instance, so if, if in your case, uh, uh, you, uh, um, you find impact uh, in society very important, then that's something that you will be judged on, or teaching is important, then that's something that you will be uh, judged on. But also uh, other skills like, um, well, sort of uh, the academic service that you do can be important. So having uh, more junior members on our panels also means that they can develop themselves. That's also uh, something that, that I think as a funder, uh, we should be aware of. It's not only about the people that we fund, but we can also offer op uh, uh, opportunities to the people on our panels. They, and well, as I said, they get to learn uh, the way uh, assessment works. They can learn from, from their experiences for, for their own uh, research. Um, so to me, it's an, an absolute win-win uh, situation if uh, we can diversify our, uh, our panels. So, James, do you think that this is something that is coming uh, widespread in the in your member organizations? Uh, as you said, it, it was one of the recommendations that we made in in our position statement paper, and and, it, and we had we had a discussion on this, and I, I completely agree with all all the points raised. I think it touches upon transparency, opening uh, up the process of what may be perceived as these kind of scary closed doors procedures um, to early career researchers, uh, improves transparency. It, it's really important for their training and preparation from when they're preparing grants. I think there's also an element, and, and this came up in, in the consultation we had with researchers in the development of our recommendations. There's also uh, an element of, of foresighting is, is a really important skill for researchers and, and, and seeing how those panels work and how those discussions take place and being involved in them can actually maybe improve the, the kind of foresighting skills of these early career researchers, which will be vital in, in the later stages as well. Um, so that, those were the reasons why we included it as a recommendation. Um, and, and finally, just to uh, um, agree with what Casper said, we, we had another recommendation on uh, increasing the diversity of panels and, and reviewer groups more generally. Uh, and early career researchers is, is one component of that uh, diversity and inclusivity. Thanks. There, we, we also have a, a question in the in the the Q&A uh, from Gabor, who I know is a, a big fan of uh, uh, open science and uh, about open, uh, also about uh, open review processes. And um, he's asking uh, basically a question whether uh, uh, we can open more data uh, from founding bodies about the uh, review and evaluation process. And this is actually something that, uh, uh, going back to the report from uh, Science Europe, that was a bit surprised. Maybe it's the nature of these kind of reports, but I thought there was uh, not that much quantitative data that was uh, put in the report. And I mean, for, for, for sure, um, founding bodies do collect a lot of statistics about who is applying for, from where, uh, on, on what kind of projects. Uh, how the evaluation process works, and so is there is there like a, uh, something that prevents uh, making this data maybe uh, public for researchers in an anonymized form, or because that could be I guess a, a very useful tool for scientists to to work on on the uh, evaluation of science. I think maybe I just from 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 our perspective, uh, I think you're right. It was it was one of our recommendations to try and share more of this data between uh, between research organisations and, and where possible openly as well. Um, I think there is maybe an element of of confidentiality in in some of the the data that is 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 produced as part of these evaluation processes. I think that was one of the maybe the limiting factors when when we had the discussion. Um, but there was a, a, a willingness to, to share the, the data that can be shared between organizations and more openly so that research can be, can be done on it. Yes, Frédéric. 
Yeah, so in, in the case of our, of our work on competitive funding, we examined about 80 funding schemes um, worldwide. And, and the data, uh, they were, you know, funders were quite uh, forthcoming with data. They were very detailed surveys, and the data are actually available on the Steep Compass database that uh, the OECD maintain. So these data are available, and, and they do go into the details of the evaluation procedures, whether they are um, ways to, um, uh, you know, to to go back to the you know to contest the results etc. So a lot of practical information. Uh, basically, what we find is that on on the um, uh, evaluation process, things are fairly transparent. The criteria that are being used, usually the funders make that fairly available. You know, maybe not exactly to the level of how do you mark or rank, but still, you know, they, they not, not always do that, but still they provide a lot of information. Where there is more of a black box is in the pre-selection procedures by the agencies um, that where they usually we could not get information on the criteria that were used for pre-selection. I mean, some are, some are just administrative pre-selection just to make sure that the proposal do fit uh, in terms of requirements. But then when there is, you know, a selection between, you know, a qualitative selection of the proposal, it was hard to get information from the internal selection procedures. But when it is on the peer review process, usually it's fairly transparent. Mm -hmm. Okay, if uh, Kasper. I, I wonder with internal, do you mean uh, the, the committee or uh, because that's, the, the difficult part of uh, how it works at a funding agency is more or less we have two types of peer review, more or less. But the, the, the committee that's also made up of other scientists. Uh, right. And so that's the internal part that you mean. Yeah, so it can be either from the managers, the internal managers of the fund of funding agencies. Mm -hmm. And that all depends a lot. You know, it varies a lot from uh, one funding agency okay. to another. Okay. And, and then at the committee level, so usually you have first step of external reviewers, and then, as you say, you have committees, but usually even within the committees, the procedures are fairly transparent. It's more the role of the internal staff of the funding agencies, which in some, a number of cases do have a role in selection process that is less transparent, usually. Okay. Yeah, then, then I understand correctly, because we, uh, at NLBO, we're not allowed to have any uh, influence on who gets selected uh, on some very specific, very small round, rounds uh, we do, but that's uh, those are not our own, own rounds usually. Hmm. So I think that we are discussing like a lot of uh, ideas that there were a lot of recommendations from, from the reports uh, that Science Europe published. Um, and um the, so how how do you how quickly uh are we going to see these new recommendations being implemented and what is the what is the main barrier to to reform and and what what do you think is is one of the major issues to changing the system uh, right now in, or to improving the system right now in europe maybe catherine you you want to start you made a, a point about that at the beginning right so um the new program Horizon Europe has just been approved in, in the last few months. In fact, I think the full legal um, approval is, is yet to come, but everything is going ahead. And so as part of the uh, implementation of this, I've participated in a number of um, meetings with the, that's been held within the ERC that are addressing a number of the points that have been touched upon here. So especially inclusivity, um, diversity, gender balance. Um, there is, so uh, the ERC is actually run by scientists. This was one of the important aspects that was considered um, inviolable that uh, the ERC council um, is, it, scientists like all of us. And so they are the ones who are considering all these issues that have been raised in terms of how fast um, certain aspects can be changed. Um, uh, 
bureaucracy can can move extremely slowly. I mean, I'm thinking in terms of the the, the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, the, the German Science Foundation, and um, in the many years that I've been involved with them, I, I haven't seen. Uh, <laughs> substantial uh, change, let's say. Um, I, I'm guessing there's there's just a lot of bureaucracy associated with this, but that's not to say that we shouldn't be having these conversations and that it shouldn't be explored where changes can be implemented that don't require changing uh, a lot of the rigid framework that I talked about right at the beginning. Um, I, I'm, we shouldn't give up. <laughs> Definitely not. But but uh, James and Casper, my, my impression from what you've said uh, in the beginning of this webinar is that there's a lot of experimentation going on uh, in, in the Netherlands, definitely, and, and also uh, at other funding bodies in Europe. So it seems like a lot of new uh, uh, ideas are being tested. Uh, and do, do you think do you think they will take hold relatively rapidly uh, in these countries? Uh, what about the Netherlands, Casper? Uh, um, well, yeah, I think in the Netherlands we have a few advantages. Uh, first of all, we're, we're quite a small country, uh, but we also have uh, a pretty tight organization of our universities, uh, and we more or less have one funder. Um, of, well, officially we have two, but we're in the same building, and the head of uh, the other agency is part of our board of uh, <laughs> directors. So um, we more or less have one. So it's, it's kind of a, um, a pretty simple system and um, that makes it a bit easier to uh, tackle some things. Um, although um, it hasn't changed for a long time, in the last few years, there's been momentum. But I think it's also because pressure has become so high that we needed to do something. And then it's just a question of a few people with ideas that are willing to go for it, more or less, in key positions. And it helps that our, uh, our president uh, uh, is interested in these topics. Um, and um, that, well, for instance, when we started with the narrative CV, um, we started with uh, just asking people that work at universities, people that uh, were funded by us, people that were rejected by us, people that advised people that uh, uh, um, tried to get funds, people that advised boards of universities. We've all asked them what, what they would want to change in our system. And for somehow, um, they most of them pointed in the same direction, which made it well, relatively easy to change things. Um, but I think, uh, like I said, we have momentum. Uh, and um, uh, right now you see that in other countries, things are moving in a similar direction. Um, uh, I often talk to colleagues from, uh, from other funding agencies on topics like the, the Torah Declaration or uh, Plan S. Um, and there's a lot of willingness to change, but um, there are also cultural differences. Uh, for instance, uh, if you talk about CVs with, uh, uh, with the DFG, there are vast, um, vastly different ideas about what should be in a CV. I've had discussions about why you would include things like marital status in a CV. So us, it's absolutely ridiculous, but it's, it's something that's traditionally in it in Germany. Um, and then um, it's it's difficult to change it if people are used to something. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It 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 seems like things are are changing, um, uh, but I think we also must keep in mind that it needs to constantly be evaluated what we're doing. That change for change is not something that we should celebrate. Um, we need to evaluate to see if we're actually doing better or not. And then if we can show that, then we can try and, and get other people on board. James, so, so uh, same, same question, but I, I guess outside of uh, the Netherlands and, and Germany, so you, you see a lot of movements in, in uh, your members? 
Yeah, so I think that there, there are a lot of changes. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of innovation and, and novel approaches being tested. I think the, the distinction to make is that a lot of the, the novel um, procedures that we've discussed today and that were in our position statement are in pilot programs rather than the more large scale generic programs. And I think we, we saw a signal where the changes are occurring, they're being implemented at, at pilot level, but we're not sure at, at the speed at which they then get converted into the more generic procedures. Um, so I think that's, that's a question that, that needs to be, to be looked at more. Um, in terms of, you mentioned what the barriers are to reform. And, and I think, and what we discussed is that there is a risk element as well. Um, so I think that uh, when actions are taken, if, they're, if they don't end up working effectively, then, then there's a chance that a whole cohort of researchers are affected by that. And, and that, uh, those affected could be affected for the entirety of their career because of, because of that. Um, so, and I think that that is, that is part of the problem to, to moving some of these uh, innovations up from pilot schemes into, into more generic schemes. Um, and yeah, just to emphasize what, what Casper said, the, the importance there is, is evaluating those changes um, and, and re-evaluating and doing it periodically and doing it every time you, you make a change so that uh, you're constantly improving upon them and at the same time in reducing that risk element. This is a this is a very good point indeed. Um, Frederick, do you want to do you want to say a few words maybe? Uh, yeah, just to go beyond Europe actually, there are um, I think a lot of funders that do realize that the current system is not um, adapted well to their current needs. So certainly in the US, um, agencies like the NSF or the NIH um, have adapted their funding procedures and have launch a number of new type of funding schemes to respond to uh, various demands, uh, whether it's risk taking or, you know, emergency funding in, in them, you know, during the crisis, etc. So there is a, a lot more flexibility in the system than before. In Asia, um, it's traditionally more difficult to, to do changes because there is a very strong cultural um, context actually the weight of the important institutions, uh, whether they are universities or research organizations, is, is very strong on the system. And the, the, so the, for the system to evolve in, in these funding procedures is probably more difficult, even though the, the funders themselves and, the, and the, the ministries realize that there is a disconnect sometimes in the way um, they proceed and in the type of project they would like to support. You know, there is a shift towards more mission-oriented projects, et cetera, for a number of those, just because they've realized that the traditional system tended to favor always the same universities and the same laboratories, et cetera, and, and it was a bit too concentrated. Uh, Korea is a system which is evolving fast just because they had more resources. They, they add resources every year, which, you know, it is a positive system where you can introduce new schemes besides the old ones and, and try to be a bit more bold in your system because just you have more resources. And, and China actually acted for many years uh, as trial and errors and, and tried to adapt a Western system to their own system again because they have a increasing funding every year so that they could respond to an internal demand which was extremely strong. So there were a number of new experiments in funding schemes in China um, that you know, try to adapt to the system. And the challenge there was just that the scale of the system was so huge that it was just very hard to manage. Um, you know, flexibility is just very hard when you have such a huge system. So there are things evolving outside Europe too uh, at different pace, but there is certainly a recognition that with again, you know, with additional expectations on the system, you have to adapt to your evaluation system. Thanks. The, the, the case of uh, Korea the, the, is very interesting. There are many other questions I'd like to ask, but I think we, we slowly have to uh, wrap up. So I'm going to uh, ask you all uh, 
a simple question. I mean, uh, what would be the the one thing you would you would uh, see changing in the next couple of years, or maybe the recommendation you would have to uh, improve the current system? And uh, and then after that, I will uh, leave the floor to uh, Martin for a few concluding words. So maybe uh, Catherine, you can uh, go first. What is it? What is it that you want to see change in the next uh, few years? Okay, so based on our conversation today, I would say more transparency and uh, more involvement of the younger generations. Casper? That's something that we haven't touched upon uh, that much, I think, but simplifying procedures, because we tend to add more and more steps to try to get it more reliable. Um, and well, what Catherine said, uh, some of the procedures are very long I mean, if we talk about something that's short and describe it as, okay, this takes seven, eight months, it's actually quite long. Um, so uh, I'd, I'd say simplifying procedures. Frederick? I think one of the lessons learned actually from the COVID crisis is that there is room for flexibility. Um, they, the funders had to react very quickly and to streamline their procedures to provide funding much faster than usual. And it did work pretty well, surprisingly well, uh, despite, you know, despite the conditions. And it probably shows that there are potential uh, efficiency gain that can be made. And also that the system needs to be flexible because there is an increasing demand for transdisciplinarity into the system. Uh, and the silos, the traditional silo system has, has proven to be you know, a, a real hurdle. And, and that is changing. And there is a realization that the funding evaluation system has to take that into account too. Thanks, James. Yes, uh, so I think we, we, we've discussed um, assessment processes today. Um, and one of the things we realized at Science Europe when we were having our discussions was that uh, assessment processes are very important, but an, another really important um, factor is, is the criteria within those. Um, and, and I think there, there needs to be a, um, uh, more activities on the recognition systems um, used in research so that the rewards and incentives um, need to be reconsidered to kind of reframe assessments towards things like recognizing the scientific process and, and, and methodologies um, and that that coupled with the, the innovations and the changes we've discussed to assessment processes can bring about that reform um, and I think for me, importantly, that needs to be done through all stakeholders. So funders, performers with universities, with the voices of, of researchers involved in it as well. Um, so I think it's, it's really concerted and collective action that's needed. Thanks. Uh, so, I mean, with these with this, uh, words of wisdom, I'm going to uh, conclude that part of uh, uh, this webinar and, and this will be the, the conclusion of our series of webinars. Uh, I wish we had more time to address uh, more questions about uh, grant assessment procedures because I think there's a, there's a, it's a really interesting topic and I think I hope it has been interesting to our audience and uh, with this I'm going to uh, uh, let Martin speak uh, to, to conclude uh, uh, our series of uh, webinars. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you to all of you. It was a great discussion. I'm glad it's over because there have been so many ideas that we need to process that I'm glad that there are no more ideas and we can start thinking. Obviously, uh, precarity, which is the initial topic, is, is, is a fact. Increased precarity is a fact and it has terrible effects on people and probably on, on science. The issue that we've been discussing in this webinar is how does it work and why? So why is it's in the name of efficiency of the system, of productivity, of excellence. And we've seen that these are uh, reasons which are maybe not as obvious and not as unproblem problematic as it seems. And how? Well, we know that it's a project-based competitive funding. And this is what we have been uh, discussing today. We know, and actually this was an issue, an important issue raised by Maria Ivancheva, is that this system of competitive funding has systemic 
consequences in terms of inequality within Europe, which is one very important issue that we need to work on. So I think my conclusion is that we, the task force, IAC, we have to go back to work so that we can make some clear proposals that might sort of change how things work in Europe and at the national level. Well, thank you to all of you. Thank you. And I want to thank our panelists once again. Thank you for your time and for your insights. It has been, it's been a really interesting conversation.